welcome everybody uh, and uh, thank you for joining us today for this uh, special 90 minute session of the advocacy exchange and uh, as we move into June and the nice weather here up north where we appreciate you all being here with us today. Uh, uh, my name is Dave Bjork. Uh, I'm a lung cancer survivor and patient advocate and I'm also vice president of empowerment here at Grit Health. I also host a podcast called the research evangelist where I interview people in cancer research and care who are doing amazing work and it's for all of these reasons that I'm passionate about today's session and I'm honored to be the moderator today. Before we begin, I wanted to take, uh, I wanted to take a moment to, um, excuse me a sec. I wanna take a moment to recognize the significance of June in the United States. And one of the things that we value in the advocacy exchange is that there is a human behind every experience, whether it's good, bad, or somewhere in between. And in this spirit, we'd like to take a moment to honor Pride Month, where we recognize the resilience and determination of our friends in the LGBTQIA community and celebrate the individuals that they are. We also honor Juneteenth, which is a day to commemorate the freedom of enslaved people at the end of the US Civil War. We're all aware of the atrocities that people endured in slavery. And this holiday is extremely meaningful, especially for the descendants of those uh, individuals. We acknowledge that people in the United States are still marginalized and that has spilled into every area of life, including healthcare. We acknowledge the difficulties you've endured and celebrate you for the individuals that you are. And we also celebrate the impact that you've made on the world by advocating for yourself and others. We will continue to shine a light on the places where the world can do better and amplify those voices. And so let's pause for a moment just to acknowledge these events and individuals. Now let's move on to today's session, which is possible because of you, the advocate community. Whether you're advocating on behalf of an organization for your family, for yourself, or have another experience, today is about building the skills to help you on your journey. We'll be focusing on two key areas for the day. Uh, for the first hour, we're gonna be discussing the power and strategy around how to share your story, specifically person to person. And then in the final 30 minutes, we'll be giving you some tips and tricks on how to use social media to leverage your message. So we encourage you to drop questions in the chat and we plan to spend some time answering them during uh, our Q&A a little bit later. Uh, you'll be meeting for, uh, the first speakers in a minute, uh, Tim Cage and John Capecci, who uh, have over 20 years of history in helping advocates and organizations share their stories to increase awareness and educate others and create change or raise funds. They're also the authors of Living Proof, telling your story to make a difference. Uh, by the way, if you haven't picked up your copy of Living Proof, courtesy of the Advocacy Exchange, please head to our program page and you can get a, a free copy before they run out. At the heart of any personal advocacy story is something critical, the reason why you advocate. And there's an exercise that John and Tim suggested that we all do to prepare for the session called the six word reason. And it's simple, if, you, if someone asked you, why are you an advocate for this cause? Um, what would you answer? How would you answer that? In just six words. If you've had a chance to do this exercise or if you wanna try it now, enter your six words into the chat box. And by the way, here's mine. Everyone deserves access to optimal care. Please remember that there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just whatever's meaningful to you. So go ahead and put that in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce the people who can help you take your storytelling to the next level. John Capecci and Tim Cage. They're co-founders and senior coaches of Living Proof Advocacy. And John, why don't we start with you? Would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Thank you for that introduction, Dave. Yeah, we, uh, Tim and I have been working together for a few decades and uh, we're gonna share a little bit about, um, well, actually the results of the work that we've been doing over those, over those um, two decades. But I'm in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul and uh, Tim is in New York. We have, uh, work remotely even before we were forced to work remotely. Uh, but we're so delighted to be here. We'll tell you a little bit more about our whole approach in just a moment. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, John. And Tim, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and then uh, you can kick, kick things off for us. Thank you. And, and um, as, as John mentioned, I, I, I actually right now I'm in Massachusetts, Dave, not unlike yourself, um, um, but I'm, I'm typically based in, in New York City and, um, and have been uh, 
have had the pleasure of being a classmate of John's a long time ago, and then in these last couple of decades plus, um, getting to work together with, with uh, so many people telling their stories to make a difference in the world. And, and we are so delighted to have this opportunity to be with all of you today. So thank you, Dave, and, and thanks to everyone at the Advocacy Exchange and Grid Health and Bristol Myers Squibb for making this, this possible. It's wonderful to be here with you. Given the um, broad membership of the Advocacy Exchange, we suspect that um, with us today, we have those of you who are patient or caregiver advocates, um, many of you who may have a lot of experience already sharing your story in order to make a difference, or maybe you signed on today because you're just starting out and are wondering where to begin. Uh, we know we have representatives from uh, patient advocacy organizations, both large and small, representatives from medical community or medical product uh, manufacturers, folks from across the globe. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Regardless of how or why you joined us today, uh, Tim and I really hope that our time together can be an opportunity to, um, to reflect and to consider, first of all, how your lived experience, um, when you share it, uh, can truly make a difference for others. And, or, uh, depending on what perspective or, or you bring to this, um, how you can also help support and elevate uh, those who are sharing their stories to make a difference. Before we dive into that content, we want to start with you and um, everyone, as, as Dave and John have mentioned, um, everyone attending has the opportunity to download a copy of our book, Living Proof, Telling Your Story to Make a Difference. And we suggested some, um, some brief reading and an exercise that Dave already highlighted, which is the six word reason. We typically use this exercise to jumpstart the workshops that we do with advocates telling their story to make a difference. If you didn't get a chance to read or do the exercise, uh, there's, there, there's no issue with that. You're not handing anything in. We're not collecting anything. We're not grading. But if you did get a chance and haven't already put it into the chat box, please go ahead and do that. And um, if you want to give it some thought right now and enter something in the chat box, your six word reason, this is a perfect opportunity to do just that. Right. And as Dave mentioned, it's a very simple exercise. Why are you an advocate for your cause, whether that is um, a condition or disease state or perhaps the organization that, that you represent? How would you answer that question in six words, not five or seven? Uh, it could be a six word phrase. It could be two, three word phrases. It could be six different words again. I and mean, when you think about the idea of the six words, it's it does it does force brevity, doesn't it? It it, yeah. it requires that that each word really does a bit of a heavy lift. Um, whether it's a list of six words, or it's as John was mentioning, a phrase, or maybe a couple of of two or three word phrases put together with some a bit of a link. Uh, but the idea is to wrestle with language, make each word counts count. And, yeah. and highlight your intention, the reason you are doing the advocacy you are doing. Yeah, Beth, you know, Beth um, thank you for sharing that. I never want anyone feeling alone. I, that's a wonderful six word reason in that it not only says why you're here, but what also the object is of, of you know, why you're advocating. Right. No one should face challenge alone, said Meg. I fight for those who are silent. A lot of folks who are really focused on the importance of their stories because real stories represent real life, says Jenny, or we all need to be advocates or use my story to create change. Excellent, excellent. So as Tim said, one of the reasons we like starting with this exercise to jumpstart things is to wrestle with language. Um, but also we like it because it gives you, it asks you for a moment to go to the core, um, to say what truly, why am I doing this? And then there, of course, is never one reason, but it also is, it reminds us of where we always start our workshops. And that is storytelling for advocacy begins with intent. That's where we always start. What are we trying to achieve and what are we are trying to do? And as Tim mentioned, also, this is a great exercise in being brief. So thank you all for joining. We'll come back to those again um, as we open things up for questions. But let's talk about uh, what we're going to do today. Um, it's safe to assume, I think, that all of us are here because we believe on some level in the power of stories, and particularly true 
personal stories that are from lived experience to create change. But when uh, does do they work uh, and how do they work? And that's really what Tim and I have been spending the past uh, few decades uh, thinking about and exploring. And that's what really what drives our work. And that's what we want to share with you today, the results of a lot of that work. It's based uh, in part on the research that uh, behind how narrative works and especially narrative creating change. But I think most importantly, it's also based in the experience of successful advocates that we have had the pleasure of meeting and working with um, over these years. Uh, the context of their advocacy is very varied. Much of it is in within the health realm, but it could also be for safety, environmental issues, social justice issues. But regardless of what the issue is, what all advocates share in common is this true deep belief that if I share my story publicly, some good will come of it and I can create change and good for others. And so today we're going to share the living proof advocacy approach to effective storytelling for advocacy. First, we'll do an overview of best practices in sharing your stories with an emphasis on how you can use the book, Living Proof, moving forward. And second, we'll pull back the curtain a bit to talk about the whole advocate model. Uh, this is a model that informs the work that we do and has helped organizations apply the perspectives to their storytelling for change. We'll also tell you about some of those organizations to, to bring to life the, the model and, and the um, illustrations we'll provide. And then we'll open it up for some Q&A before um, passing the baton to, uh, to our colleague, Kate Callen, who will be providing thoughts on how this translates into social media. Right. It's going to be a lot in a short amount of time. Here we go. First of all, what is the power of your story to make, make a difference? Well, certainly probably the most obvious and one of the most powerful aspects of sharing our story is that it has the potential to create empathy. When we share our lived experiences with each other, there is the potential to engender empathy and for our listeners to say, I feel for you and what you've experienced, or I understand now in a different way and I share your concern, or this is wonderful, or this is frightening, or, uh, or this is wrong. But I think as you and so many of the other advocates we work with, speak with, would agree, we can't be satisfied with just empathy. We want to move people from empathy to action so that, that um, someone says, you know, I feel for you and what you've experienced, but they say more than that. They say, so I'm going to do what? To, to join this committee, to vote for this initiative, to donate to this cause, to campaign, to raise awareness, to take the next step, to take the action that you as the advocate want me as your audience to take. This, this is our North Star, this idea of moving empathy to action. And it's behind everything that we'll be talking about with you today, aimed at moving our listeners from empathy to action. Right. So if you have had an opportunity to uh, digitally flip through the ebook of Living Proof, or when you do, you'll see that the whole, our whole approach, the Living Proof Advocacy approach, is based on these five principles, what we call the five qualities of a well-told advocacy story. Uh, these are qualities that we find contribute most directly to stories that move people from empathy to action. So what we're going to do in this first um, portion of our time together, is we're going to give a real high level uh, overdue, overview and introductions to them. You can certainly read a lot more about them in the book. And also there are lots of exercises within the book for each one of these qualities to help you sort of explore how it applies to your own uh, storytelling. If you're already out there sharing your story and, and had some success doing so, you probably have already encountered the importance of one or more of these five qualities. And the first up is that, that effective advocacy stories are focused. What we mean by this is that the more closely and clearly you connect your story to messages and goals, the more successful you will be as an advocate. When we share our lived experiences as advocates, we need to be crystal clear about our messages and our goals, or they can so easily get lost. People can engage and empathize with your experience and, and, and what you're sharing about what you have lived as your experience, but it's up to us as advocates to clearly connect the dots to the messages and goals, uh, that the, the goals that support your purpose or your intention in sharing your story. So here's an example of an advocate that you'll meet in Living Proof. 
And before we dive in and continue here, I want to take a moment to thank uh, and acknowledge the advocates who genu gen generously shared their lived experience and their stories with us for the book and that we're also lifting up and highlighting here for you. Right, and this is Jacob Smith, our friend Jacob Smith. Uh, Jacob um, was in a terrible car crash uh, involving a distracted driver and his car was hit head on. He su suffered severe spinal and facial and traumatic brain injuries. But while he was in the hospital, uh, he told us he already decided that when he gets out, he's going to be sharing his story so that this doesn't happen to others and that he could help save some lives. And that's what he did. As soon as he was able to, he uh, um, started speaking in various venues and high school assemblies and, and others. But then he stopped. Uh, he stopped because he told us he realized that all people were focusing on, all they really wanted to hear about was the crash. And in fact, that's all that they were remembering. So he stopped he reflected on this and re refocused his efforts. And so he says to us, now I always start with, what can I bring to this audience? It may not be my entire story. It may just be one bit of my story that supports the advocacy message. And that's, that's what we mean by focus. The second uh, quality of a well-told advocacy story is that advocacy stories are pointed to the positive. Um, advocacy stories succeed when they point to the positive change in you or the positive change you are you want to see. Uh, now, an important point about this, when we say point to the positive, we're not talking about sugarcoating our experiences at all. Um, people need to hear um, what happened and what is the situation that needs to be changed. What we do mean by this is that we need to strike a balance when we share our stories with others to create change. Uh, we need to balance the, the pain, the problem, the inequity, the trauma, with the hope, the solution, the action, what we want to urge others to do. And admittedly, this can be really tough sometimes, especially when you are so driven in your advocacy to want people to know this is how bad it is. This is what needs to change. Uh, this is how immense the urgency or the, the need is. But the thing about this quality is if we leave people there only in that place, then we haven't moved them from empathy to action. So striking that balance. Here's another example uh, from an advocate in Living Proof. Christina Sparrick is an advocate with the Stability Network, and that's an organization working on advocating for workplace mental health. Her experiences arise from trauma uh, of living with bipolar disorder and PTSD and psychological trauma. But here's what she says about sharing her stories to advocate, advocate for workplace mental health. Christina says, people need to know the pain and the hurt, but they need to know what's possible moving forward. I don't want anybody to suffer the way I did. So I ask others to join me in imagining a day when people can share their diagnoses without fear of retaliation or discrimination. A great example of striking that balance. They need to know this, but let's envision the better day that we're working toward. The third quality of a well-told advocacy story is that effective advocacy stories are crafted. Advocacy stories succeed when they draw people in, create scenes, and transport listeners. Notice that this is quality number three. Craft. Craft is often where people think we're going to start when they hear we're going to talk about effective advocacy and storytelling. But storytelling for advocacy is different. Craft is absolutely important to engage listeners in your story. Um, but notice that we didn't begin with the idea of what makes a story good. That's not where we start. We begin instead with what are you trying to say or do with your story? What's your focus? What's your intent? What's your reason for being an advocate? We begin with that, and then we get to craft. Crafting means th the basics of good storytelling are in place, such as, as the narrative of, of learning how to edit and, and jump forward and backwards in time, finding the vivid, evocative language that will engage your audience. Here's an example. So, uh, Sepi uh, Zabala is um, 
uh, another advocate for the stability network. And uh, when she shares her story, it is about uh, disclosing mental health conditions in the workplace. And as she talks about that, um, here's how she describes it. Hiding an illness like mine is like hiding a hippopotamus in a Walmart, even tucked away in the pet section, only a matter of time before that illness is found out. That's just a really simple way to, to quickly get the message across. I, I, I love the idea of just in two sentences, this a vivid description, very relatable, but also a very vivid metaphor, a lot packed into those two sentences. Um, in the chat box, you'll find a link to the Stability Network's second annual storytelling event, The Power of Storytelling, where you'll be able to um, access all of Seppi's advocacy story. The fourth quality of a well-told advocacy story is that ad effective advocacy stories are framed. Advocacy stories succeed when it's clear what they're about and why you're sharing. Sometimes it's easiest to think about the notion of framing as how you would want, how you wouldn't want someone to frame your story. I don't want them to see my story as what? Simply complaint? Do not want me to see, see me as a victim of? So how do you want that story to be framed? Framing statements are the things that we say around our story that helps control how you want to be seen and heard because people walk into listening to your story with perhaps their own frames in mind. This is going to be a story about X. Where How do you want them to view that story? So here's, um, here's another example. This is Kathy Kasten, a heart health advocate. And Kathy frames her story of heart disease this way. She says, this isn't just about me. This is a societal issue. This is a community issue. This is the story of thousands upon thousands of women. I'm talking about your sisters, your grandmothers, your aunts. So even though Kathy's story itself is very compelling and, and wonderful that she's sharing her specific experience, notice how she frames it though within the larger context, this is not just about me. And she frames it within all of the other women who are impacted by perhaps not recognizing um, signs of, of heart disease. Finally, the fifth effective story component quality is practice. Effective stories are practiced. We should all aim to speak naturally and genuinely and clearly and confidently, but being natural and genuine and clear and confident does take practice. This quality is a reminder to give yourself the time that it takes. Learning the skill of sharing personal stories publicly is very much a process. You'll find in Living Proof a number of suggestions on how best to practice your advocacy storytelling, all of which aim to build what we call improvisational speaking. It's planned and practiced, but it still provides all kinds of latitude for conversational tone and approach and flexibility. So there you have it, the five qualities of the well-told advocacy story. Just do that and you'll be fine. Uh, we say that jokingly knowing that this is a process. Wouldn't it be nice if there was one recipe for how we share our stories with others that is we know will connect every time, but audiences change, we change, our experiences change. We found that these five qualities of well-told advocacy story give you a really nice foundation. Also a way of like sort of check, checking, have I really focused on my message? Did I point to the positive and did I balance it enough? Have I spent some time crafting uh, to, to really bring folks into the story? So moving forward, uh, what we recommend is obviously with you working through the book that you take your time to consider each one of these five qualities and how they impact the way you share your story. And also, and again, whether you're just starting out or whether you're looking at how you've been sharing your story and how you might tweak it accordingly, uh, here's some suggestions we have um, for how to use um, the ebook or if you get a, a paperback version of Living Proof. The first on the list is to keep a journal. We think keeping a journal can be a very useful tool, whether it's digital or analog, you've got a place where you can re record your thoughts and practices, insights and ideas for developing and honing 
your advocacy story of lived experience. It's useful to have as an ongoing evergreen resource. The second thing we suggest is as you work through the book, whether you have uh, an upcoming opportunity to share your story or this is hypothetical, uh, we think it's really useful to set some parameters for yourself. Give yourself, for example, I'm gonna prepare a three to five minute advocacy talk. And then when you decide that to get as specific as you can, decide who that audience is, even imagine where you're going to be. Is it gonna be remote? Are you going to be uh, delivering it live? And then decide on your goal and messages. So do that strategy work first um, before you start figuring out how was my story, does my story fit into this? I should mention too um, uh, that this, what's on this slide right here is um, also can be downloaded. That link should be in the chat in just a moment. Yep, there it is. Terrific. All right. And, and you know, in doing this preparation for a, uh, this exercise of preparing a three to five minute advocacy talk, look to the templates. Chapter nine has a, a slew of template possibilities to, to work with. And, um, and within those, you'll see the brief, brisk advocacy blueprint, which we found is often the go-to template for especially those those um, relatively brief three to four to five minute advocacy talks. They enable you to, in a very organized uh, way, pack a lot of punch into, into how you bring your advocacy story to life for advocacy purposes. And finally, we wanted to mention that as you go through the ebook, and if you have a paperback version, there's the links are there in that book as well but you can download um, fillable PDF versions of all of the exercises that are in the book. So if, if you are working primarily digitally, that comes in handy, or you can print them out and, and be analog and actually fill them out by hand. Okay, we're gonna shift now, shift perspective a little bit uh, for the next last 15 or 20 minutes of, of our time here before we open it up to, to your thoughts and, and questions. Um, the first of what we've been talking about, we've really been focusing on those of you who are thinking uh, of, of being an advocate and sharing my particular story. Uh, now we want to talk a little bit more to organizations that it, may be represented here, because this is the whole advocate model. As Tim mentioned, this is kind of pulling back the curtain. This is our conceptual model of how that guides really everything we do and how we work with individual advocates. It's based on what we found is necessary. We consider ourselves in our role as coaches, the advocate's advocate. Everything we do is, is, is predicated on the success of advocates. So what do we need to bring to this in order to create the most, the ideal environment for advocates to thrive? That's what this is based on. But again, it's also based on what we've heard uh, from talking to so many advocates and a lot of patient advocates over the years. For example, this is what we heard from Melissa Adams Van Houten, a patient advocate for gastroparesis, who, who told us, as a patient advocate, I fight not just for myself, but for the broader illness community. So I want to know that my efforts and concerns will be met with respect, that they will be valued. I want to know that if I share my personal experience with you or participate in your research study, my involvement will be meaningful. Or as when Tristan Lee, a sickle cell disease patient advocate we spoke with, shared this with us. As a patient advocate, I truly value when I'm addressed as such. It's a badge of honor that I wear with pride. I take it as a sign of respect and value for the years of lived experience, knowledge, and insight I provide. So what the whole advocate model does, it takes that respect and the value that Melissa and Tristan mentioned and puts it right there in the center of the model, surrounded by these five attributes. And again, we'll go through them briefly um, and give you a couple examples of how they play out in, in work with and relationship with patient advocates, but we're really curious too to hear from those of you who are working at organizations that either are supporting advocates or relying on them to share the story, how this resonates with you as well. So to support advocates fully as they, they take their personal lived experiences public, um, here's, here's what the whole advocate model recommends. The, if the first circle sort of upper right is skill. 
help advocates acquire, develop, and practice the communication, storytelling, advocacy, and media skills needed to be effective public advocates. We, we view this support in the broader area of communication skills and try always to include that skill building in what we offer. Right. The second is care. And this just reflects that the fact that we respect and attend to this significant process of going public with a personal experience, especially in terms of emotional, physical health and safety. Um, as I said, this is one of the most important aspects of how we work with, with folks because this is a unique uh, communication context. And as so many of you know, who have taken that step across the threshold from private to public, it's not always an easy step. And even if it is an easy step, there's a lot going on there in terms of physically, emotionally, psychologically. So we always try to bring that into our work to talk about that, to, to acknowledge that what it is like to, to make this choice. Uh, and a quick example of how this you know, can influence how we uh, work or the, or the relationships with patient advocates. We've seen, for example, some medical product manufacturers who bring in uh, patient advocates to get your story, to understand what the symptoms are, the diagnosis, to understand the patient journey, right? But when you over also think about the, the importance of, of care for the act of going forward, it expands the kinds of questions we ask. We don't just ask, when did you feel the symptoms? When did you get your diagnosis? We also ask, what do you want to see happen as a result of you speaking out? How does it feel to be sharing your story here? So it elevates, again, that experience of this person who has made the choice to go public with a personal experience. Continuing to work around the circle, the, the, the bottom position is information. Urge advocates to arm themselves with the messaging, relevant facts, and organizational information to support the importance of their stories. As advocates, you are the experts in your experience, but the most effective advocates are offered the opportunity to gain expertise in the broader subjects of healthcare or development, development um, of drugs and devices or whatever realm they're advocating within. For example, working with Women Heart. Women Heart typically every year or so has a symposium gathering uh, Women Heart champions in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic, where they absolutely have patient advocate workshops to develop and, and, and hone and practice their, uh, their championship of, of women's health, um, heart health advocacy. But over the course of a couple of days, they're also experiencing uh, workshops and programs and panel discussions with experts in, in, um, in health, in, in heart health and science and research and development in nutrition, in lifestyle. So they're, they are given tremendous breadth and depth that informs and supports and contributes to and facilitates their advocacy. Right. Um, the fifth um, aspect is context. Um, it's, it perhaps is obvious, but a lot of what this model is, is constructed to do is to guard against individual stories that are simply inserted where needed, right? We believe it's really important for advocates to know and consider as much as they can about how they fit into uh, the broader effort, as well as their relationship to a particular audience with whom they speak. So understanding where my story and my uh, advocacy fits within the larger realm, not just a one-off contribution. I think that actually was the fourth component around the dial. So the fifth is agency. Sorry, John. Right. Um, this is the idea of empowering, um, it, it, empowering advocates to identify, own, and preserve their authorship, their voice, their experiences, and the use of their stories. The, the idea here is that this helps guard against sometimes appropriation or co-opting of personal stories without regard for the voice, the ownership, and the role of the advocate sharing lived experience. So that is the whole advocate model. One of the ways we've seen it um, prove useful to organizations 
is working, uh, I think, in with medical product manufacturers, um, pharmaceutical companies, biopharma um, uh, companies who are operating on a patient-centric model that obviously and wonderfully places the patient in the center of the whole process. And so uh, what, what a change that has uh, uh, facilitated over the past 10 years or so, but just as the patient-centric model places the patient in the center, when you put the patient advocate in the center and overlay, again, it does deepen the nature of the relationship because you are honoring not only this patient's experience, but this patient advocate's experience of wanting to see change, of, of taking the risk to go public with a, a personal experience. Um, that's the subject of a white paper that you also could download uh, from the program page uh, it's called Improving the Quality of Patient Engagement by Centering the Advocate. And it is really focused on those patient advocate professionals within the industry whose role it is to elevate um, the voice and the role of patient advocates. And you can, uh, there's another link to download that in the chat box as well. There are a few other ways that we're seeing various advocacy organizations apply the living proof advocacy approach to their work. And there are, there are links, there will be links to these in the, these organizations in the chat box as well. Uh, first, probably the most obvious way in which we're, we're seeing um, organizations uh, put the living proof advocacy model to use is in building speakers bureaus and networks. Uh, Tim just mentioned Women Heart, who we've been working with, we have the pleasure of working with for um, almost 20, over 20 years. Now, um, Women Heart uh, uses this, this foundation as the basis of their training of their Women Heart champions uh, every year at the symposium that, that Tim had, had mentioned, and then supporting uh, the Women Heart champions with small group work or individual work throughout the year. And to date, they've, they've trained more than a thousand women with heart disease who are out sharing their stories, making a difference. Um, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is another organization we've had the pleasure to of, of working with, they too use this as a model for their basic um, speakers bureau as we bring in no, new cohorts of speakers, get everyone on the same page of what we're trying to achieve by using these five qualities. But they've also applied it to specific initiatives as well. And we'll talk about those in a moment. And then we mentioned the stability network um, uh, earlier with Sepi Zabala's um, talk. They based their entire program on this perspective on how um, um, effective advocacy stories, ad, advocacy stories work um, in their case and how to, to share mental health journeys in a way to reduce stigma, particularly uh, in the workplace. So those are just three examples of, 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 of speakers bureaus who are, are using this as sort of the, the, the baseline model of getting everyone up on the same page. And beyond that kind of foundational work, there's also campaign specific preparation um, John mentioned FSR, and, and F, an example of this is FSR's recent uh, successful Ignore No More campaign focused on African-American women and sarcoidosis. Um, also in preparing their advocate patients and caregivers to share their experiences with the FDA in FDA listening sessions to uncover unmet needs, influence research, drug development and approval for the treatment for treatments for sarcoidosis. Right. Uh, we imagine many of you are involved at some point in legislative advocacy as these three organizations that we worked with uh, have been the Peggy Lillis Foundation which is focused on, on C. diff the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance and the Sickle Cell Disease uh, Association of America, all of them have used this method to specifically prepare their advocates for their days on the Hill. And I'll tell you in this case, this is a one uh, case in which the brief brisk advocacy blueprint comes in really handy of trying to hit all five of those qualities in the three minutes you have with the legislator, it can be done. And that's what these organizations have been uh, working on uh, with this method. On the local level, smaller organizations like Gilda's Club, Twin Cities, a local chapter of the cancer support community, um, has applied this approach when preparing members to speak at fundraisers. Um, another Twin Cities organization, Interfaith Outreach, which serves and provides uh, families basic needs in the community, adopted the whole advocate model to shift away from the very nature of how they work with and value 
stories in their organization. And then finally, um, working with medical product manufacturers, pharmaceutical and biopharma organizations uh, have explored this model, as we mentioned, as a way to enhance uh, patient engagement, um, but also how to support global initiatives um, and uh, work on internal campaigns. For example, um, having um, staff of, of the organization sharing their stories and their personal connections with the important work they do on behalf of patients has been a really powerful um, um, project that we've seen a, a couple of organizations um, take part in. So it's a lot of different applications, um, large and small, uh, and internal and external communications. And we're, we're constantly um, uh, buoyed by uh, seeing how people take this and, and use it to support their advocates. Um, that summarizes, I mean, uh, the, the two models really that we wanted to uh, present to you today. The first one of the five qualities is really focused on the individuals sharing their story. And as we've said, with lots of tools and suggestions, and we can talk more in Q and A about where to go next. And then the, also the whole advocate model, which really does inform uh, really the kind of support and kind of relationships that we feel are most beneficial to any individuals who make the, the critical important choice to go public with a personal story. That's what we have. I'll turn it back to you, Dave. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, John. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in. Some have come in privately, uh, but I'd like to uh, ask you, and you guys can decide you know, which one wants to answer the questions because you guys are a great team, by the way, because I've done this before, apparently. <laughs> um, so the first question is, how do you know what the most important or key elements of your story are as to avoid including unnecessary fluff? We often, Dave and, and, um, and all, um, in, in Living Proof, telling your story to make a difference, we, we encourage the idea of a, of a story map. Um, there's a horizontal line with the word then on the left and now on the right, an oval, and then we encourage people to really think about moments, scenes in their experience, um, events that, that are inflection points throughout what they've, what they've experienced from the, the before times, whether it is, it's, uh, it's back then when the, the first time a symptom emerged or, or I got a diagnosis, whatever the then is, and then with that exercise, where you capture a lot of moments to then think about the messages, the, the goals, and with those crystal clear links, realize, you know, this is an interesting aspect of my story, but this moment is less necessary in a three to five minute advocacy talk, because it really doesn't give me the opportunity easily to link to one of my intentional goals, one of my messages. Um, so it, it helps the editing process as a drafting process where you capture all kinds of possibilities and then distill and decide. John, what, what to add? Yeah, well, you know, we, when you're talking about that first quality of focus, we mentioned that how important it is for the audience. You need to connect the dots for the audience. Focus is really as much for you too. Focus helps you decide what's in and what's out. I'm here today to talk, to make sure they understand this thing, then what is, what are those moments that are living proof of that particular message? That really helps you sort of, and sometimes it's difficult to, to edit. It's always difficult to edit. Um, and the other thing too, is that one of the, what we've seen advocates very often do in terms of craft is rather than going, stepping through the entire experience chronologically is to say, here's what happened, here's the big picture zoom in on this moment, because this is what I want to focus on today. The fact that the symptoms were not noticed, you know, so what, or whatever that message is. So that helps you really sort of focus on not trying to tell everything, but the critical aspects for that particular goal and message. Yeah, it's the, it is that idea of, of you know, providing that overview or summary and then fast forwarding or doing a deeper dive um, for this particular point and that particular point. It's the, where you really then get descriptive. You get, you create that scene, 
you give us a sense of what 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 you saw, what you experienced, both um, inside and outside. This is what was happening. This is how I felt. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think it's I like the way you you use words like focus and and the fact that you can edit. Like it's it's okay to edit your your story, right? And so you might not get it right the first time. So it might be a process for for some for some individuals or maybe all of us. Um, what tips or suggestions can you give to a nervous presenter telling their story for the first time? Yeah. So um, w- one of the ways we look at when stories work for audiences to create change is the spectrum um, on one. And you've all, you've all experienced this both as people sharing your story as audience members. So on one end of the spectrum is the raw story. When you hear someone share a story where it, you can tell they haven't spoken this before, or this may be the first time, and it's very emotional. It is literally raw. It might be going all over the place. And you think about how you feel as an audience member, you may be concerned for that speaker, right? Rather than listening to the story or getting a message. On the other end of the spectrum is the canned uh, 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 presentation where you hear someone tell their story and you think, wow, they, they, they're really good at this. They've done this a lot. As opposed to connecting with the story and really um, um, uh, listening to the messages, we always want to try to avoid that raw story. So we we encourage everyone to recognize that this is a process, recognize that you are the author and you don't have to, if something is difficult to talk about right now, that doesn't have to be a part of your story, you get to decide. And the other thing, recognizing that it is a process is to start incrementally. So maybe it is with a small group that the first time you wanna try, I'm gonna try speaking out the story this time before you say, hey, I'm ready for for the events put me up there. Um, never do we enter into a vulnerable situation. Speaking, speaking publicly already is a vulnerable situation. Sharing your personal experience in that situation makes it even more vulnerable. And again, this goes back to the care element. We never want to do anything to put yourself at risk emotionally or at health physically. Tim? And, and that, you know, that said, there will, in many cases, certainly some cases, be uh, parts in a, in a given story, an advocacy story of lived experience where the, the speaker, the person who's sharing an experience, um, brings it all right back. And so even with practice and having told that story many times, when I come to this part in my story, it always knocks my breath out or it, it always, it's like, like I, I've, I've hit the brakes. Um, and and um, making sure that the advocate recognizes that if, if it's a part of their story that they really need to include, that there are ways to address that. Simply, sometimes simply telling the audience, you know, every time I get to this part in my story, I have, this is what happens to me. Yeah. And that's because, so just, just making it part of the story can be, can be a, um, a, strategy, a tip for dealing with it. In other cases, um, it's, it is uh, giving the advocate a, a tool. Sometimes when I'm talking about something difficult, I find myself pressing my thumb into my forefinger and that directs at least some moment of energy <laughs> into my finger and I'm able to muscle through um, something that can be a challenge. So there are physical and physiological devices as well. But to John's point, the point, it's crucial to recognize the vulnerability and to take care in, in what you tell and how you tell it. In addition, John mentioned the, the, the raw, uh, and just as we, we w- want to encourage people away from the raw to practice beyond the raw and determine their stories, we also want to remind them to avoid going too far, going to what sounds canned. And that's why we really zero in on what we think of as the the sweet spot, which is the well-told advocacy story in the middle, where you get the engagement from the audience, you get them intrigued and, and moved by your story, moved to empathy, but able to get the message from it. 
and to take that next step. That's great. Thank you both for that. I think everyone can be nervous at times <laughs> going public, but just, I like how you mentioned the vulnerability and it's okay um, to be vulnerable. But um, the, an- another question came in, uh, when you put yourself out there so personally, how do you stay resilient when people aren't open to hearing your story? Yeah, there's one of the things that we've um, added to the book over the years, this is the third edition, is a section on self-care and what we've heard from other advocates, because that, I mean, that's such a great question. Um, How do you keep your motivation up when you feel like it's not, no one's hearing it or or you don't feel as though they they want to hear it? and, and it's, there's no one single answer for that, but it really is, the advocates we've spoken to have got some great uh, um, ideas for how to stay focused and also take care of yourself. One of them is, is to surround yourself with the community, not just the community who understands what you're going through perhaps as a patient or caregiver, but a, a community that understands what you're going through by sharing your experience. So that you can debrief with after, that you know, call or that panel you were on to say, I just, I feel like there were crickets. Like this isn't doing any good at all. Where can you work that out? Cause it is hard to keep motivated in the long run. But as, as often as we hear advocates say, I sometimes feel like this, this is not going anywhere. We have as many examples of advocates who two years into it, three months into it are blown away by somebody who emails them, who somebody comes up to after the performance, after the perform, after the presentation, and says, you know, what you just said is changing the way I think about X, Y, Z. I mean, so it's 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 recognizing that there may be one or two who take away that gold knowledge, and that is success. Yeah. yeah, that's a great way to measure success. I I agree with that. Um, I had an interesting uh, question come in. Um, and it, this, this person says, I had an interview with me having to answer questions. I knew what I wanted to focus upon, but don't know if my answers were effective. How do we tell our story in an interview setting? It, it's, it is rec- doing that sort of situation audience analysis is always a, a very useful component. You know, is it a a Q&A format? Is it a media interview? And so as, as John and I uh, prepare people for that kind of opportunity or upcoming event, it is exploring the kinds of questions that are anticipated. So you, you recognize, okay, this is what they really want to know about. And when you think back about the advocate Jacob, who, who was in the horrific uh, 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 oncoming crash, uh, people were most interested in in the crash. Um, so, you know, you anticipate the kinds of questions that people gravitate toward, which is often the before or the back then or the, the trauma. And then think about the ways to deliver your lived experience in that moment that does more than that. What, what, crystal clear link can you use? What bridge can you build from that to one of your advocacy messages? Recognizing that many of the questions that you'll get, if any, will not invite you to your advocacy. So you want to to both scratch the itch in the question, but also do much more than that while you have platform, while it's your turn to talk. So you do more than answer the question, you respond to it, you answer plus message. I'm just adding really quickly too that in the book, there's a whole section on media interviews um, and how that's very different from when you are in complete you know, control of, of sharing your story and how to navigate that relationship. And then there's also a section just on tips and techniques for when you're doing an interview directly to the camera or when you're doing a phone interview or you know, those very specific settings as well. Yeah, that <clears throat> thank thank you both. That was really that was really helpful. But having done some of those media interviews, I, it it totally is a different experience. So I, I think that chapter would be really really helpful for people that are you know considering or being asked to be part of that. Yeah. So I, I want to say 
like I said, you guys obviously have done this before. You guys, I love how you play off each other and 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 offer your, your unique perspectives. And this has been really, really useful. And it really hammers home the importance of sharing your story. Uh, so really, thank you um, so much, uh, John and Tim. I wanted to say one quick thing. The, the positive, I, that was what struck me the most was when you, t- and not just sharing your story, but in lung cancer, I can tell you that it's not about the, su- the sad stories. It's about the hope because there's a lot of amazing research that's going on. So that, that really resonated with me. So um, thanks, John and Chan from Living Proof Advocacy for helping us learn how to bring more power to our stories and um, really appreciate it. And thanks a lot for, uh, for coming, for being on the show today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Now we're really excited to build on what John and Tim shared and bring visibility to the stories that we're telling. Uh, And we all know that social media um, has been an incredibly powerful tool over the last several years and that many people look to social channels for information and commentary and sometimes just to gauge, you know, what a personal organization is doing. I am personally invested um, in social media. People who know me uh, know my my go-to is Twitter. Um, I use I use it really to amplify my voice and experience and connect with others, uh, particularly in, in my case in the lung cancer uh, community. But to me, it's all about connection. And I've built these amazing relationships with patients and clinicians and researchers and and other advocates, you know, and many of these have become friends of mine now um, offline. So uh, to me, it's a it's it's a super important part of my uh, personal advocacy efforts. And so for this reason, I'm happy to introduce uh our next guest is uh, Kate Callen, and she is Executive Vice President and Head of Social Media for Evoke Kind, a health communications and public relations uh, agency that we're also fortunate to work with uh, in the advocacy exchange. And Kate has over 15 years of experience working in healthcare communications and has been at the helm of award-winning social and influencer campaigns. She, she's also spoken and contributed to various industry events and publications on social media. Uh, Kate, uh, welcome. Uh, and we'd love to have you uh, take a moment to introduce yourself and then share your best practices for how we thrive on social media. Thank you so much, Dave. So um, as you mentioned, I head up social media for Vote Kine, um, and I've been very lucky in my career with about 10 years ago was the first time I actually worked directly with patient advocates. Um, and that sense of connection that you mentioned, Dave, that you've gotten from social media like totally changed the trajectory of my career to now be heading up social media for a boat kind. So um, I really love and I'm passionate about the connection that advocates can find on social media. Um, and I'm really thrilled today to walk you through um, some tips and best practices if you're just starting out on social, um, if you've already been active on social media and are not really getting the traction that you're looking for. Um, what we'll go through today, so Tim and John r- really grounded you in articulating that story, pulling it together, getting comfortable in the story that you want to tell publicly. Um, So I'm really going to focus today on how can you take that story um, and start activating and sharing your story specifically on social media. So we'll go through almost like a mini strategy exercise, really starting off with that social media goal. Um, So what I loved about Tim and John's presentation was thinking about that six word reason, um, because that is a great way to really think about your social media goal as well. So really grounding yourself in ultimately the impact that you want to have, what you want to accomplish, why you think it's important to be active on social media. Um, And I had written down one of the um, examples that somebody shared in the chat that I thought was great um, from Meg that no one should face challenge alone. And I thought that was a great one to link into a social media goal of fostering connection. So as you're getting started on social, just really thinking about um, your experience and what you think is needed um, in the community. So that could be simply raising awareness or dispelling misperceptions. A lot of times, particularly in rare disease, we'll see a lot of misperceptions um, about a particular condition. So just starting to um, help people understand what people living with your condition are going through um, could be a social media goal that you're starting with. Education and providing tips and tricks, I've seen that be really useful and meaningful in um, chronic conditions. So when people are living with a condition, you know, they get diagnosed ultimately living with that for the rest of their lives. If you are someone who has lived with that condition for several years already, you probably have a lot to offer other um, patients in the community about whether it's daily life, um, work, parenting, um, and just going about, you know, day-to-day activities living with a particular condition. 
um, and then going all the way up to advocating for change. So how do you actually, you know, move into action um, and change the way things are currently being done um, related to your condition? So once you're grounded in what your ultimate goal is and your objective for social media, um, the next thing I want you to do is conduct a little bit of research, and that will just help you understand the conversation that you're going to be entering into. The first place that I always suggest people go to is look at, are there advocacy group, groups that already exist um, related to you, um, your topic or your condition? A lot of times these groups will already be active on social media. Um, they'll have potentially Facebook groups that you could join. Um, so it's not that you're going and trying to copy or recreate what they're doing, but you want to understand what's already out there. And then what are opportunities to, for you to potentially bring something different to this conversation that's not already being covered? Um, what types of content? Is it a lot of video? Is it static and still images? Um, what topics are being covered or not? And then you can also search by particular um, hashtags to get an understanding of a, of a, a disease related condition to, again, just understand before you jump in what's already that conversation and what connections could you potentially make um, within a particular area. So the next step before we even get to what social channel you're going to, um, you know, launch into, I want you to really think about personally, what is your communication style? Um, so Tim and John were really focused on that um, verbal articulation of um, your communication style of your story, but you don't necessarily need to be um, a great speaker to be really active and really meaningful on social media. So what do you really naturally lean into in terms of your communication style? Is it heavy into written word, writing your story? spoken word, are you comfortable on camera or are you not comfortable on camera? Um, you know, is it second nature for you to kind of pull up your phone and do these talk to camera style um, videos? Or if you're someone who is just naturally very creative, thinking about, um, you know, art as an, um, an avenue for social media, that can also be really interesting and different to kind of break through what people are already doing on social. So really, again, reflecting on naturally, you know, what's your inclination and then um, diving into what social channel we would select. So ultimately it's about being authentically you. So if you're getting active on social and you feel like I have to be active on TikTok, like that's the trending channel, but you, you know, it pains you to create a video. It's not something that's going to be sustainable to you to really um, continue to be active on social media. So grounding yourself and being authentic to your natural style, your story, how you communicate and what you um, uniquely can bring to the conversation is what I want you to really focus on as you're getting active on social media. So in terms of channel selection, thinking through that goal, what you want to accomplish, the conversation that's happening and where you naturally lean um, in terms of your comfort level. I want you to just start with one social media channel. You don't have to be active on everything. You don't have to be everything to everyone. If you really can focus in when you're getting started, that's going to be much easier to really um, build um, a content repository to get comfortable in whichever social channel you select. And know that you do not have to launch across three channels because that's another way where, um, you know, I see people kind of quickly burn out. They feel like they have to launch on several channels and then it's just way too much um, to keep up with. So start with one and potentially moving into others um, as you progress in your um, social media journey. So what I'll go through now is just a little bit high level on really um, the top four channels that I see most patient advocates having success on or being most active on, and that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the newest in TikTok. So from a Facebook standpoint, it's kind of, um, you know, the original of the modern social media platforms. Um, there's been controversy over recent years. It's kind of lost a bit of that cool factor in terms of social media channels, but it's still the largest social media um, channel that exists today. The audience is definitely starting to skew a bit older. So if you, um, you know, if that's an audience that is important to you and that um, is relevant to, you um, you know, your disease area or the audience that you want to reach, 
then it still may be a really relevant channel for you to look at. The one caveat being it's really challenging on Facebook to, to break through the feeds and build an audience when you don't have a paid budget behind it. So what can be really um, meaningful for patient advocates is to think about Facebook groups as opposed to pages. A lot of um, Facebook groups exist, as I mentioned earlier already. So kind of dipping your toes in and getting active in Facebook groups, or if a group does not um, already exist, consider starting a group on your own versus um, putting your effort on a Facebook page. Instagram is really the platform of choice for more of that mid-range audience, the Gen Z, the millennials. It's my personal favorite social media platform. Um, and it still does have more of that cachet um, and growth that is kind of dropped off with Facebook. Um, there's a heavy push on Instagram if you're current, currently using it on video and reels, which is kind of that TikTok copycat. But overall, um, Instagram is starting to move to more vertical um, content and feed so that the content as you're scrolling that takes up your whole screen, that's really the direction that Instagram is moving into. That being said, it is still a mix of static images in the feed um, and video content. So it does offer a nice um, range of content types for patient advocates, and it's a huge channel for patient advocacy, so certainly one um, to consider. Twitter is the platform where if you're a really comfortable in written word and not so comfortable creating video content, um, that's one you know, to definitely consider um, for your patient advocacy. It's got more of a trending news and conversations lean than some of the other social platforms um, and not quite as big as the Instagram, Facebook, but still has a pretty dedicated and consistent um, user base. Facebook and Instagram have a pretty even split in terms of male versus female. Twitter actually skews heavier male, um, which is a little different than other social platforms. So keep that in mind in terms of audience you may be trying to reach. Um, but it is certainly one for the, the written um, spoken word and kind of sharing those quick thoughts and updates um, with the community. So TikTok, that is the big trending platform um, and has had huge growth over the past couple of years during COVID, quickly growing to a billion um, monthly active users. It definitely skews younger um, than other social platforms, but it is starting to trend up in um, the older 18 plus, even 30 plus audiences. So it's slowly starting to overtake some of the users that may be um, currently on Instagram um, as the platform matures itself. This platform, while Twitter's skews heavier male, um, TikTok actually skews quite heavy on the um, female audience. So again, keeping that in mind in terms of the ideal audience you're trying to reach. The big caveat about TikTok, it's really video only focused. So if you're that written word person, um, you know, you're probably going to be torturing yourself to get on a platform like TikTok because it'll be just so out of your nature in terms of how you're comfortable communicating. A little bit different than other platforms is it has this for you feed. So it's very heavy on discovery. So one of the kind of cool things about TikTok is your average person. So anybody getting started your um, video content can sort of go viral out of nowhere. You don't need to have that big follower base like you do on another platform because content, um, the algorithms are a little bit different on TikTok and they'll serve up content that just resonates with people regardless of um, you know, the follower count that you might have. So once you've landed on the platform that you're comfortable with, that you want to start to build out, um, really the two main things in terms of the content um, you're creating is about consistency and engagement. So your audience, when they follow you on social media, they want to know what, what do I expect? What am I going to get from this person um, by following them? They want to understand, um, you know, what's kind of your key message in terms of, um, you know, the messages that you'll be sharing. What is the kind of information that I'll get, be getting? Um, so starting out with creating some content themes for yourself um, can be really helpful to organize um, your plan and organize the types of things that you're going to be sharing on social media. So again, thinking back to you don't have to be everything or do everything. 
It may be very focused on tips and tricks. It might be focused on just simply sharing, you know, day in the life, your everyday life with this um, condition, or it could be your um, sharing news and highlights and events um, that are happening within your conversation area. So really focusing on those, those themes to kind of guide your content in the future. In general, brevity is best, certainly to start out on social. Um, I do see some people being successful with more of those micro blogs. So that means having that a longer caption on Instagram as an example, but to start out, definitely starting with brevity. And once you build your audience, kind of testing, um, you know, if that longer storytelling is something that your audience um, enjoys. The post frequency is a big question. Um, I typically get, you know, how often do I need to post on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram? Um, and my overall position is that the consistency is much more important than the frequency. So um, think about what is going to be sustainable for you personally. So if that is, okay, I can commit to one Instagram post a week, you know, go with that to start and adjust from there versus worrying about, oh, I need to post every single day and kind of, again, burning yourself out. In terms of engagement, um, there's a few things here. And engagement, I cannot emphasize enough how important engagement is. So that means engaging with other accounts that maybe you identified in that research part of things, following those accounts, commenting on that content, resharing some of their posts on your page, um, that kind of two-way um, dialogue is going to create the connections. It'll get you in front of um, some accounts that are um, probably relevant to you and who you want to build as um, your own sort of mini community. And that can really go a long way to accounts when they're starting out on social media to kind of build that following an audience. So as much as you can, as much as you have the capacity to um, engage with others, if you post something and somebody comments on it, comment back, try to answer their questions and really build that, um, that connection and that community um, with your, um, your audience on social media. So in terms of determining success, I won't get super heavy on analytics, but wanted to just give you a very high level framework. So if we think back to your social media goal, um, making sure you're writing that down and you're thinking about, you know, if your goal as an example, is connection. You might assess whether you're doing um, well and reaching your audience and your objective by looking at the engagement you get on your content. Are people commenting? Are people liking it? Um, that sort of thing to determine whether um, you know people are relating to the content that you're putting out. So on a monthly basis, just reflect back on what you've put out over that month, whether it is the engagement or the comments that you're wanting to see. So you can do that simply by looking at the content that you're posting, but within each social platform, they do have more detailed analytics. So anybody with a Twitter account, you can get some analytics on your account um, by going into kind of the back end of your account. Um, you can also do that with different types of accounts on Facebook and Instagram as well to see more of, if you're more of a data nerd and, and like that kind of thing to get more um, deep analytics on your social content. And then the third is just changing as needed. So if you're seeing, okay, people are really liking when I post pictures outside, but when I post pictures of like, um, I don't know, stock images, people aren't loving that. They're not commenting. They're not engaging. You want to do more of what is working and generally less of what is not really hitting the mark. So... On the next few slides, um, I just wanted to give you a few more ways to continue learning and some inspiration um, before we wrap up. So continuing learning, the good news is that there are a ton of free resources to really get your social media um, news. So the first one here, the Pew Research Center, they have a social media report. That's where a lot of the um, statistics I shared with you came from. They also do regular um, commentary on various social channels. So that's a nice resource center. Social media today is probably, if there's one from this list that I would recommend, it's social media today because they curate a lot of um, updates and news from various social um, channels. 
So if there's one place you go, social media today, you can get the news from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, of what updates are being made to social because there are updates every day um, and how that might impact what you're doing on social media. And then each social channel does have their own Twitter handle. So like Facebook has a Twitter handle um, and so forth. And then of course, other patient advocates. So over the resource research, um, hopefully you've identified some patients and some connections. So following them on social, maintaining that engagement and really um, kind of getting inspiration from one another is um, a great way to continue learning. So with the inspiration, um, I have a few that I wanted to share with you today that kind of lean into some of the um, kind of communication styles I was talking about in the beginning. So first, first is Sabrina Skiles. She's a breast cancer advocate. Um, and as you see on the example here, she's really leaning into um, Instagram reels right now. So she is looking at trending sounds or trending um, concepts on the platform. And then the content that she's creating, um, you know, you can see a couple examples here on like what to wear to chemo. Like she is taking the trending things happening on Instagram and then using her personal experience to get in front of her audience. So again, for those more creative types that are comfortable on video, um, Sabrina is a great example um, to look at. And then Haley is an autism advocate and Haley, quite differently from Sabrina, she's really not doing any um, video on Instagram. She's doing static images. And what I thought was so interesting and different about her is that she is creating her own unique art. And that's what you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen here. A great example of if you naturally are autistic or artistic to create that content and post it on a channel like um, Instagram as a very different way to communicate your point um, and your experiences to a new audience on social media. And then for those leaning more into the written word, um, a great example here, Josh Robbins, he's an HIV advocate. Um, he is very active on Twitter and you'll see the examples here. He's not really using images or videos. It's really just his own personal perspectives, um, resharing other kind of trending moments in time and adding his commentary onto those on the right-hand side of the screen. And then I wanted to point out his use of polls. So that's also really great for getting, trying to get a feel for what your audience wants to see from you. Like don't underestimate the power of polling your audience and directly asking, you know, what is, what kind of content would you like to receive from me? And with that, I hope this was helpful. Um, I really want to emphasize over everything that it's just important to really think about, you know, where your comfort lies, your unique story. There are people out there who want to hear it and will gain so much by you sharing your story. So just stay true to that and your authentic um, story on social media. That's awesome. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> A lot of really good uh, information there. Really. Someone really hit home with me, particularly like being yourself and uh, finding your uh, doing the research and and um, making those connections to other people. So and having a strategy. Right. So when you start, I think when I started, I was like, I'm going to get all these followers. But it's like then I really understood that, that it's not about that. It's really about the connections. Um, we did have um, a few questions uh, that came in uh, for you, Kate. And the first one is, how do you create content other people will want to share? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, so I think it just totally depends. I mean, there is no one ultimate answer. Um, one of the things in terms of like content that's very shareable in general um, that I see across social media, tips and tricks is, al is always huge <clears throat> in terms of things that is that are like shareable because it's going to positively impact other people. Um, so that's a great thing to kind of test out. And don't be afraid to encourage people to do that if that is your goal. So um, saying, for example, here's my top five tips on whatever, share with your audience who think may benefit from this. Like, don't be afraid to kind of do that because that ultimately help guide your audience to the action that you would like them to take with your content. Great, thank you. Um Another question, and this is actually this one, I, 
I can totally get this one. How do you keep people engaged when you need to take a social media break yourself, which I, I, I get that sometimes. And I've actually, again, like to not, to be transparent with your audience. So say you've built an audience, you've built a following to put a post that says, Hey guys, I'm going to be offline for a couple of weeks, like taking a mental health break or whatever. I think that's totally um, appropriate. And it's actually then helps your audience model that behavior because all of us need a social media break every now and then. Um, so I think it's having the confidence that if you step out for a couple of weeks, it's not the end of the world. Your audience will be there when you get back um, and just kind of letting them know, Hey, I stepped away. I'll be back. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's, it's challenging, but we all do need a break sometimes. Yes. I, I agree with that. Um, another question, how do you find the line between attention grabbing posts that people want to read and engage with and not burying, burying the importance of your message especially with character limits? So I think there's a couple of ways for character limits as an example. So that's very relevant to Twitter. So if um, for getting around character limits, you can um, do multiple tweets and kind of group them and it's like a mini blog almost. Um, So that's one way. I would always start with what is your key message? Put that first. And then for your followers that are there to stick around and read more, you can always kind of extend beyond that, but you want to start with the first sentence or, sentence or so on any platform is all people see before the they have to click for more. So that's your more, most important line that you want to make sure you get your key message or your call to action in before you give them that more detailed maybe story. Uh, well, thanks, Kate. And I think all the information that you shared is really, really helpful. So you know, thank you for taking the time to guide to guide all of us through how we can effectively use social media to amplify our message. Um, and I love the fact that you really you really emphasize making connections because I think that's that's so important. And that's how when I use Twitter, you know, doing the research to find who would care about this, what I'm going to talk to, and you tag those people. And what I love about Twitter is that you can connect instantly with somebody across the world if you, if your message is. If you're tagging the right person who cares, and don't just tag people because they're famous to see if they'll, you know, retweet it or whatever, right? You, you actually, because I look at your profile and say this person's legit, and then you'll you'll make connections that way. So, um, so really, thanks so much, Kate, for for uh, for your presentation. Thank you. I was thrilled to be here. So I'm glad it was helpful. Awesome. So I, I want to thank all of our speakers, John, Tim, and Kate, uh, for bringing us such great content on how to tell our stories in the most effective ways. We want to also thank, um, excuse me, our interpreters, Emily and Mackenzie. And of course, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We've been fortunate to hear so many impactful stories from the people in the advocacy exchange. And together, we're moving healthcare forward. I really believe that. Uh, We'll be taking a break from live sessions in July so everyone can focus on time with family and friends and mentally recharging. Uh, We will, however, be featuring our exhibitors and resources uh, on our platform, so stay tuned for more information about that. Uh, If you're interested in viewing prior sessions or for more uh, information on upcoming events, please visit uh, theadvocacyexchange.com for more information. Thank you again, and, and have a great rest of your week.